our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. The psalm for this Easter sunrise set is one, Psalm 118, which starts with the words, This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Mary Magdalene woke early that morning, and she was not necessarily glad. It did not feel like the day which the Lord had made. In fact, it was the day after the day after the day that the Lord had died. Her Lord, her teacher, her Rabboni had died. So on this Sunday, the day after her Sabbath rest, she was not rejoicing, she was not glad, rather she was dutifully doing a visit to the grave of her friend whom she had, been, whom she had seen crucified just a few days earlier. The stone was rolled away, his body was not there, and so she ran to Jesus' disciples to tell them the news, the good news, to proclaim the Easter gospel. But she did not know yet that it was good news. She did not know that it was the gospel. She thought it was the worst news possible. She proclaimed to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb. So who is the they? Who took the Lord out of the tomb in Mary's mind? Who was it that stole the body of Jesus Christ? It certainly wasn't the Roman soldiers. They had nothing to gain by hiding Jesus' body. They needed the body to be secured. They could not afford to allow any rumors of a resurrection to agitate the people and cause a political stir among the empire. No, the Roman soldiers did not take the body. And indeed, it wasn't the Jews either. They also had nothing to gain. They had no reason to steal the body. They wanted nothing more than for Jesus' body to be there and to rot there in that tomb. They wanted to prove that Jesus was indeed a false prophet, a blasphemer, that he was not who he had claimed to be. A dead Jesus would mean that they were the godly ones. They were the righteous ones. They could claim that they had done the Lord's will by crucifying this man. So again, the Jews most certainly did not take the body. And it wasn't Jesus' disciples either. Now these disciples were fishermen, not soldiers, not fighters who would overtake these Roman guards. And as we see in the rest of the Gospel's account, these disciples were terrified, locking themselves behind closed doors because they were afraid of the Jews and the Romans would come for them next. <coughs> No, Mary Magdalene should have known better. When she said, they have taken the body, she should have known that he was not stolen. She should have known that what had happened was exactly what Jesus said would happen. She had heard the Lord's teachings. She knew who he claimed to be. She had heard him say that he must go to Jerusalem to face trial, condemnation, mocking, flogging, and crucifixion. And then on the third day, Jesus said, she had heard him say that he would rise again on that third day. She had heard these things. And that Sunday morning, that early Sunday morning, even before the sun had come up, she had seen those prophecies fulfilled. Those things that Jesus had said had been fulfilled in her sight. All that the Lord had told her, all that the scriptures before him had taught, all that he himself had said, 
she doubted. She questioned her Lord and she looked for an alternate explanation. They have taken away the Lord from the tomb. Well, as Christians, we are often called to defend our faith, to prove to others that what we believe is true. As Christians, we can be exhausted by the, by the world's doubt, and this could even lead us into doubt ourselves. These days that do not seem like there is much to rejoice in, these days where we have trouble being glad, these are the days that we must cling to the promises of God and the hope that is ours in Jesus Christ. But if our hope and trust in God and our faith in Christ is questioned, we often don't know how to respond. We are often unprepared to give an answer for the hope that is ours in Christ. And this makes us easy targets for scrutiny. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, as followers of Christ and as devoted disciples, we should have better answers, a better defense for when skeptics and unbelievers ask us about our faith. But when Mary Magdalene comes to Peter and John, when she explains to them that the Lord's body is not in the tomb where it ought to be, well, maybe, just maybe, they do not need to be afraid anymore. Maybe, just maybe, Jesus was who he said he was, and they were overcome with the possibility that he was risen indeed. They raced to the tomb to see for themselves. They ran to the tomb on this day which the Lord has made. And so they too went to that tomb so that they might rejoice and be glad of it. Yes, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, it is because of this day, the day of the Lord's resurrection, that we have the hope and expectation that we too will rise. It is because of this day that we trust in the Lord's promises that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. It is because of this day that every day is a day to be rejoiced in and be glad in, because it is a day that the Lord has made to bring us one day closer to the eternal life with him in paradise. This day, Easter Sunday, the resurrection of our Lord, this day, is the center of our Christian faith. All of our questions and all of our doubts, all of our fears and all of our uncertainties are answered on this day. Why do we believe the word of God is true? Because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Why do we believe in Scripture's account of a six-day creation and not just go along with the world's teaching of evolution. Because he is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Why do we adhere to scripture's teachings on all sorts of moral topics, including marriage and family, gender and sexuality? Why don't we just let people live their lives as if this is all there is? Why don't we just leave people alone to do as they please? Why are we so concerned with words like sin and condemnation and righteousness and eternal life? Why do these things matter? Well, you know the answer. Because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Why do we claim to have the truth when it comes to spirituality? Why are we so insistent that Jesus alone is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him? Why do we say that Jesus alone is the way? Because Jesus alone is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. 
Yes, this is the day which the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. It is a day that we do not have to wonder if what we believe is true. It's a day that we do not need to ask ourselves if the teachings of Scripture are correct or accurate. It is a day that we don't have to question whether there is a God, and we certainly don't have to question how He feels about us. All of the teachings of Scripture, all of the articles of faith which we confess in our creeds, these are confirmed and verified by this simple fact, that Jesus was not in the tomb on that Sunday morning. And if he is not in the tomb, if no one has taken him from his tomb, the only reasonable explanation is that he who said, says he, that he is who he says he is, and he has done what he said he would do. The only reasonable explanation is to rejoice and be glad because, hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. This is the day. This morning is a morning unlike any other in the year of the Christian church. Because this day's events, which we celebrate today, these are the heart of the Christian faith. And every Sunday throughout the year is yet another heartbeat another sign of life, life that is ours in Christ because he is risen, just as he said. The Lord has made this day so that we may believe and that by believing we may have life in his name. The Lord has given us Easter so that we may rejoice and be glad in each and every day that he has given to us. He has given us Easter so that all our fears and terrors, all our questions and doubts, may be put to rest. Because Christ is risen indeed, and if death itself could not defeat him, well then it will not defeat us either. Death is the last enemy to be defeated, and the victory belongs to Jesus. Therefore, the victory belongs to you as well. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.
And then we heard this gospel reading, which usually includes Jesus' teachings, some kind of a parable or some other instructions, or maybe something that he has done, a miracle or something. Something that has Jesus in it. The gospel always has Jesus as the star of the show. He is the main character. He is front and center, speaking and doing as only Jesus could speak and do. But today's gospel reading is without Jesus. In today's gospel reading, Jesus says nothing and does nothing. Jesus is entirely absent from today's gospel reading. And that is the good news. Yes, the only time Jesus' name is mentioned in our gospel reading today is when the angel says he is not here. He was not present. He did not speak. He did not teach. He says nothing. And that is what sets this day apart so uniquely and so strangely. The gospel reading which tells us the good news of Jesus Christ on this most holy day of the year doesn't even have Jesus. He is not there. Now sadly, this might be the case in many so-called Christian churches on every other Sunday throughout the year. Easter might be the only day that some of these churches talk about Jesus. Sadly, every other Sunday might be a self-improvement sermon, or the latest social justice initiative, or some kind of what we call woke agenda, or some moral lesson on being a better person. But sadly, a lot of times in many Christian churches, Jesus is scarcely mentioned. But Easter is a day that we cannot help but to talk about Jesus and what he has said and what he has done. After all, this is the gospel. This is the good news that gives us hope and promise of eternal life. And hopefully today, every Christian church is talking about Jesus, at least for today. So how can we have a gospel reading that's supposed to bring us the gospel message when Jesus is noticeably absent, when Jesus is not there? Well, of course, the answer is quite obvious, isn't it? He is not in our text today because he was not supposed to be in our text today. He was not in that tomb because it could not hold him any longer. Death in the grave had no power over him. He was not in that tomb because he told us he would not be. He accurately prophesied that he would be betrayed, given over into the hands of sinners, mocked, flogged, and crucified. The angel says, remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. Indeed, he always told us that on the third day he would rise. He is not in that tomb because he promised he would not be in that tomb. And Jesus always keeps his promises. That is the good news. That is the gospel, isn't it? That he is not here. He is not here. He is risen just as he said. And then watch what happens next. They remember. They remember what he has said. They believe, even though Jesus isn't standing there in front of them, even though all they've seen with their eyes is an empty grave and some angels, they believe. And with an active, living faith, they dash away to tell the disciples that wonderful news of that first Easter morning. 
Confusion and fear change instantly to belief and hope. Soon, they will see Jesus. They will know exactly where he is. And they will know that he is not in that tomb, but he is rather with them. At that moment, though, at that first moment on that first Easter Sunday, Jesus was not there. Now, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, life can throw us a lot of different circumstances and situations. And sometimes as we go through life, it seems that Jesus seems noticeably absent. Sometimes it seems that we are going through our own trials and tribulations all on our own, all by ourselves. And we live in our own Good Fridays, asking, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We have our own shares of arguments, disagreements. We have feelings like we have been betrayed and abandoned by our closest friends. We have our own losses, our own pains, and our own sufferings. Perhaps we have financial hardships, loss of employment, or just grumbling that it's getting harder and harder to pay for things like gas. Or perhaps it is mourning the loss of a loved one, whether recently or many years ago. And that pain and that sorrow and that grief is still very real. We wonder, when we have our own Good Fridays in our lives, we wonder, where is Jesus? And the devil would tempt us to believe that he is not here. He is not with us. He has abandoned us. He has forsaken us. He doesn't care. But Easter, this festive day, the day of our Lord's resurrection, this festive day of celebration is here to turn the devil's lie into the good news that we need to hear each and every day. In the midst of our trials and our tribulations, in the midst of our own sufferings, your own crosses to bear, hear the angel's proclamation. He is not here. He has risen. <laughs> and dear friends, if this is true, and it is true, then the resurrection of Jesus comes to you as the best news possible. The absence of Jesus on that Sunday morning the fact that he was not in that tomb means that he has conquered Satan, the world, and sin once and for all. So the resurrection gives us the good news that we need to hear in any situation, circumstance, trial, or tribulation. If Christ has taken the sting out of death, does he not also take the sting out of all of, all of life's other circumstances? If Christ has triumphed victorious over the grave, will he not also triumph over the things that trouble you now? If Christ has fulfilled his word by his glorious resurrection, will he not also fulfill his word when he says to you, I am with you always, even to the end of the age? Jesus says, I am with you. Now we might see in our gospel text today, and we might feel in our own lives that he is not here, but the Lord keeps his promises. And when he says, I will be with you, he is with us. Jesus, by his word and sacrament, by being in our midst today, through the preached word and through receiving his body and blood on the altar, is with us. He is not here. He is risen. Changes to he is now here. He is right here. Right here with us. Very present with us. Speaking to us and doing stuff. And each of us will come to that time when the last great enemy, death, will comfort us with all of its ugly, frightening, confusing reality. 
We will stand before a grave, and the test of faith will rise up from the depths of our souls. And so what is our hope in that moment? On this Easter morning, listen once again to the words of the angels. Remember how he told you, while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and on the third day, rise. The women, staring at an empty tomb, needed to hear these words. He is not here. He has risen. But we, for a living faith and a confident hope, need to hear these words differently. We need to hear this message once again. He has risen. He is now here. Alleluia, Christ is risen. In the name of Jesus, amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.